record. There we go. Welcome, everybody. Uh, great to see you all. If you can put your camera on, uh, it would be greatly appreciated, both for the speaker and for the audience. Um, welcome to uh, week 50 of the Chabura. We are very, very excited to have a very special guest tonight discussing a very important topic that uh, we, we've touched upon in many a shiur and many a discussion on our discussion group. Uh, so I'm, I'm very excited to have a, a coherent and, 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 and thorough analysis of this topic. Uh, before I introduce our hacham tonight and the topic tonight, uh, just some quick housekeeping. As you all know, uh, membership mode begins July. So we are now three weeks away, please God, from starting membership mode. Uh, we've, as I said, we've got over 100 uh, Talmidim and Talmidot signed up around the world. We're very, very excited to begin that. So if you haven't signed up yet, please do visit thehabura.com forward slash join. Uh, any questions or queries you have, please do reach out. Um, uh, we'd be happy to help solve any challenges that you may come across uh, after exploring the very exciting membership program that's coming up. Other than that, uh, we've got a new series by Rabbi Dweck beginning on Haraf Cook. Uh, we'll be sharing that information in the discussion group and our third journal will be out in the coming weeks as well so stay tuned for that moving on to tonight's guest it's a uh, hacham that i was recommended to reach out to uh, after having spoken with raf phillips who kindly made the introduction i believe raf phillips gave a uh, a talk um, at the rav institute and when he had mentioned that there is this rav from this maimonides heritage center i thought where do i know that that name, Maimonides Heritage Center, from and I realized so many of the articles that I had uh, read on Harambam when I was discovering Harambam uh, were written by those writing for Maimonides Heritage Center. So um, it was no surprise to me that when I got to meet with our guest speaker tonight, Rav Levy, uh, I was so, um, uh, I, I felt so much like I had connected with him. And I felt that the Rav really understood what we're trying to do here at the Chabura. So I'm very honored that the Rav here is here tonight to share with us. Uh, Rabbi Yamin Levy is senior rabbi at the Iranian Jewish Center, Beth Hadassah Synagogue in Great Neck, New York. He is also the founder and director of the Maimonides Heritage Center. He is an academic writer, novelist, and author of numerous articles on Tanakh, Jewish thought, and Harambam. I am very, very honored. We are all very honored to have you here tonight, Hacham, uh, on a topic, as I mentioned, that we have all discussed before. Uh, but I don't think we've had a shiur that actually digs into the weeds of it all, which is what are the differences with regards to epistemological, legal, cultural differences between uh, Sefarad and Ashkenaz, and really focused on the three areas that I think have a lot of misconceptions, which are Minhag, Halakha, and Machshava. So, uh, Hacham, we're very happy to have you here. The stage is yours. Bechavod. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good afternoon and good evening. Uh, thank you, Sina, for the kind introduction. I'm going to pass on the small talk and get right to work. The title of the lecture is uh, Untying the Knots. Uh, the expression Untying the Knots comes from uh, an unlikely place, the writings of Rabbi Avraham ben Shemuel Abulafia. He lived in the 13th century. He's best known for his eccentric and fantastical mystical experiences, usually pegged as one of the famous Kabbalists of the Middle Ages. The reality is that he was probably bipolar. I don't mean that in a flippant way, and I don't say it in a derogatory fashion, but based on his biography and his writings, his hallucinations, he clearly was not all there. He did devote a good amount of his intellectual activity to interpreting the More Nevuchim, Harambam's guide to the perplexed. His understanding of the More is for another time. But a line that he uses often in his work on the More is one must untie the knots of the brain in order to know truth. That is going to be my modest goal this afternoon for me, evening for you. I want to begin the process of untying some of 
the mental and theological knots that often lead to confused practices, ideas, and notions. Let us begin from a broad strokes perspective. A few months ago, Rabbi Joseph Dweck gave a talk where he discussed the differences between Sfaradim and Ashkenazim. He invoked Yosef and Yehuda, and in his own words, he addressed the issue from broad strokes on a more world view scale. My approach is much more detail oriented. I'm interested in root issues. Is there an epistemological difference between Sfaradim and Ashkenazim that leads to their differences in practice or in legal adjudication? We will often get something like Ashkenazim are more machmir, stringent, while Sfaradim prefer a more mekil, lenient approach to Jewish law and Jewish life. This response is not only wrong, it is filled with apologetics. One of my favorite apologetics is, it's harder to be lenient than it is to be stringent. And yet, tragically, we find this approach in the words of our very own Chachamim. Uh, Rabbi Chaim David Halevi uses the language that Sfaradim clung to the quality of chesed, while the Ashkenazim clung to the quality of gevura. Unfortunately, neither of those qualities are legal principles or legislative terms. It's apologetics that only further the tying of knots in one's brain and in one's soul. Heschel, Abraham Heschel, not that I take what he says in this context seriously, but for your edification, he presents what I call his reverse apologetics. He, of course, was an academic, a, a, a well-known intellectual, and he cleverly frames the European approach as the romantic approach, while the Sephardic approach is the more classic approach. This is found in his book, it's called The Earth is the Lord's. Rabbi Ben-Sion Uziel, the first Sephardic chief rabbi of Israel in his introduction to his Teshuvot, Mishpete Uziel, touches upon what I believe is the correct direction. But unfortunately, he too falls back on apologetics. He suggests that the difference between Sfaradim and Ashkenazim is their attitude towards Minhag, but he doesn't finish the thought. So allow me to take his thought a little bit further and finish it. Defining Minhag is not an easy and simple matter. The term Minhag is used interchangeably in three very different contexts and can mean three different things. Minhag comprises of a formidable body of Torah Chachamim. The first are minhagim that emerge directly from halacha and are rooted in halachic practice. These minhagim may have emerged as a way of, of validating alternative legal positions. I'm going to give you an example. There's a universal custom among the various groups of the Jewish people to recite Hallel on Rosh Chodesh. The Gemara in Masechet Ta'anit lists the name of, uh, lists 18 days of the year where Hallel is recited. Rosh Chodesh is not on that list. The Gemara concludes that there is no obligation to recite Hallel on Rosh Chodesh because one works on that day. The Gemara then tells the story of Rav, who visited Bavel and saw the community reciting Chatzi Halel on Rosh Chodesh. And so he accepted that custom. What emerged with regards to Halel on Rosh Chodesh is that the Jewish people have accepted the practice of Halel on Rosh Chodesh as a way of expressing the unique sanctity of the day. 
the very practice validates that alternative position of Bavel. Hallel is therefore considered an example of a minhag ratified by Chazal as a way of validating an alternative tradition. The Rishonim then discuss whether or not a Beracha should be recited on the Hallel of Rosh Chodesh. Harambam and others argue that since the entire recitation is based on Minhag, no Beracha should be recited. Rabbeinu Tam and the Rosh argue that since it is an important Minhag, a Beracha should be recited. As a result of this Machloket, three Minhagim have emerged. Sfaradim do not recite a bracha on Hallel of Rosh Chodesh in accordance to Harambam's ruling and subsequent Sephardic codifiers. Ashkenazim recite a bracha on Hallel of Rosh Chodesh in accordance with the opinion of Rabbeinu Tam and Rosh. Note that they created a new category of law, important minhag. Sephardic Jews of North Africa assumed a compromised position. Only the Chazan recites the bracha and the community respond with amen. So this first type of minhag, it's minhag that is rooted in halacha. There's a second type of minhag. Minhagim that are not rooted in halacha but are established as practice and have authority by virtue of the fact that the people of Israel have embraced that practice. An example of this is the Talmud discusses the fast days observed in commemoration of the destruction of the Bet HaMikdash. The Gemara in Masechet Rosh Hashanah Dav Yod Chet Amud Bet responds reports as follows. It was Rav Papa who asserted that during times of oppression, the fast days must be observed. During times of peace, the fast days are turned into days of celebration. And when it is neither times of oppression nor times of peace, one can choose to fast or to not fast. So here's a good example of minhag adopted by the entire Jewish people. The Jewish people have taken upon themselves the observance of these fast days, and no individual has the option to do otherwise. Every code of Jewish law, including the Mishneh Torah Harambam, codifies the four fast days associated with the Beit HaMikdash as halacha. These fast days are indeed considered halacha, but they are neither biblical nor rabbinic. They're not the oraita or the rabbanan. They are minhag, and they can therefore be considered less critical, but not less authoritative. These two categories of minhag have been ratified by the Sanhedrin. Regarding these two types of minhag, Harambam writes in Hilchot Mamrim, and I want to read to you from Hilchot Mamrim at the beginning of Hilchot Mamrim. Harambam says, Beit Din Hagadoshi Rushalaim Heim Ikar Torah Shebalpe, the Supreme Court of Israel that rests in Yerushalayim. That is the source of Torah Shebalpe. And he continues, Vechad Devarim Sheasaum Siagla Torah. They may rule, legislate laws that are pertinent to that very moment that are called siag la Torah or gezera and takana. These are different kinds of decrees, not for today's discussion, and min hagot. Kol echad vechad me'elu ha'shloshad v'rim mitzvat ase lishmua lahem we have an obligation to follow the ruling of the Sanhedrin regarding these matters. If you transgress, you've transgressed a lota'ase of 
the Torah, Lotasur, of the Sanhedrin. There's a third type of minhag. The third type of minhag emerges locally, within a community, within a family, and is more likely than not based on local cul culture, customs of the society around them. Most of the minhagim associated with marriage or with life cycle events fall into this category. The, the text of the Ketubah, for example, um, is a minhag. The Syrian community in Brooklyn have a clause that the husband can divorce the wife if she doesn't bring children within 10 years. The Ashkenazim have a custom that the bride encircles the groom seven times under the chuppah, or a groom has to wear a raincoat or not wearing a raincoat under the chuppah. These are strictly minhag of this category. Only those who share that tradition observe those minhagim. And if they choose not to observe it, there is no halachic consequences. Like halacha, the first two types of minhag expose Judaism's core values. This is a very important point. The nature of law and any legal system represents the values of the society. The third category of minhag reflects the community's fears and possibly aspirations. The third type of minhag speaks to how a community dresses a particular life cycle event or navigates moments of joy or sadness, often emulating local culture. Herein lies the most dramatic difference between Andalus and Europe. European Jewry makes no or very little distinction between the three types of minhag. For the Lithuanian and Hasidic worlds, the third type of minhag has the same authority as the first two types of minhag. I am part of a worldwide rabbinic WhatsApp group, and it includes Sephardic and Ashkenaz rabbis. And I see how my colleagues, the Ashkenazim, are trapped in this world where they can't distinguish between minhag and halacha. Recently, one of my colleagues asked the group about the color of the ink on a ketubah. Halacha states the ink must be permanent, but because the minhag has been to write it in black ink does not make it halacha. Andalusian jury understood the difference in legal implications and authority. Let me give you an example from an article I wrote and that was published um, uh, by Rabbi Mark Angel in his uh, journal called, uh, uh, I forget what it's called right now. The article is called A Comparative Study of Sephardic and Ashkenazic Wedding Ceremony. And there are many examples. Here is one. The halacha is that Kinyan Kiddushin is performed with Shaveh Peruta. Sephardim, to this day, in many pure Sephardic communities, use a coin or a piece of jewelry, something of worth and of beauty appropriate for a chuppah. In the Ashkenaz world, Kiddushin can only take place with a tabat, a ring. Not only that, the ring has to be round. It must be yellow gold. It must be placed on the forefinger of the bride's right hand. And there's a whole body of literature as to why this must be so and what it symbolizes. Everything from beautiful ideas, from Gan Eden to Mahmad Har Sinai, what emerges or what emerged as a cultural minhag turned into a halacha with significant authority. I am here using a non-controversial example. 
and I don't want to upset anyone, but read my article for more examples that have ruffled the feathers of many of my Ashkenaz uh, friends and colleagues. So we need to answer, how did this happen? Why does European Jewry view culturally and locally born minhagim as universal and authoritative? And herein lies, it's very important to understand the historic difference between Sepharad and Ashkenaz. And I, I trust all of you know this, and I, I apologize if it's repetitive, but it's important to reiterate and iterate uh, uh, to fully understand. The term Sepharadi has nothing to do with origins from Spain. Rabbi Sadia Gaon was referred to as Hasfaradi, and yet he never stepped foot in Spain. He was born in Egypt, lived in Israel, and died in Iraq, Bavel. To be clear, Sepharadim do not necessarily come from Spain. They also come from other lands. For our purposes, a more accurate definition of Sephardi is a Jew whose diaspora experience took place in a non-Christian society post the destruction of the second Beit HaMikdash 68 AD. While Ashkenaz Jewry, on the other hand, <coughs> includes all of Jewry whose diaspora experience took place in Christian lands. This working definition explains the Sfaradi attribution to all the Jews from Syria, Persia, Yemen, Egypt, and Libya, none of whose ancestors necessarily originated from Spain. It does get confusing, however, because Sephardic Jewry does include Jews whose ancestors emerged from northern Christian Spain, who may indeed share some common customs, as well as land of origin, but whose philosophic underpinnings are much more aligned epistemologically with Ashkenaz Jewry. For example, one cannot place Ramban, Nachmanides, and Harambam, Maimonides, in the same school of philosophical thought. Nachmanides believed in spirits and ghosts. He believed in magic and communicating with the dead. He says so unapologetically, while Maimonides, Harambam, thought that they were a figment of people's imagination. According to Harambam, those views were nonsense. Nachmanides and Maimonides both emerge from Spain, but are heir to two vastly different philosophic traditions. Nachmanides' creative output is influenced by medieval Christian theology, authoritarianism, and the mysticism of Northern Spanish Franco-German schools with little or no access to the philosophical and scientific works of the day. On the other hand, Harambam's creative and philosophic output is influenced by early medieval Islam's openness to Greek philosophy and sciences from Southern Spain. Additionally, one must note that the Jewish community of Northern Spain was further influenced to a certain extent by the presence and rulings of the great rabbi Asher ben Yechiel, who lived between 1250 and 1330, also known as Rosh. He emigrated to Spain from Germany around 1286 due to the persecutions of Jews in those parts of Europe. His presence 
was so commanding that his rulings were considered authoritative in Castile and in Toledo for over a dozen years. So just allow me to frame this just a little bit further. Following the destruction of the second Beit HaMikdash around 68 AD, and certainly after the failed rebellion of Bar Kokhva around 135 AD, the Jewish settlements in Israel began dispersing. Many joined their co-religionists in Iraq, Babel, Persia, Egypt, and North Africa, while a significant sector of the Jewish population emigrated to Italy and Europe. Judaism at this point ceased being a national religion tied to a land. Instead, both Jewry and Judaism became synonymous with the study of Torah, with the observance of Jewish law and the development of Minhag. The study of Torah flourished in Christian Europe, but it was an environment that was limited, an environment that limited their practitioners' access to secular texts, to philosophy and science. And this resulted in Torah scholars becoming experts in rabbinic texts, but ignorant of Tanakh, Hebrew grammar, literature, secular philosophy, and certainly sciences. In its place, Ashkenaz Jewry developed what might be a myopic conception of Jewish thought influenced by the spiritual mysticism of their environment with the expected trappings of superstition, demonology, necromancy, and magic. This attitude, surprisingly, survived the Middle Ages right through modern day rabbinic rulings of Ashkenaz authorities. And I take, for example, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, uh, who died in 1986 of blessed memory. He was raised and trained in Eastern Europe, emigrated to New York, and continues to be recognized as the rabbinic authority of modern day Ashkenaz Jewry. For Rabbi Feinstein, the study of secular subjects is at best a concession to the laws of the host country. He forbids the study of scientific texts that deny God created the world. A teacher of science rules Rabbi Feinstein must rip the pages out of the textbook. If you want to take the source, it's Igrot Moshe, Yored De'a, volume three, um, Siman 73. In traditional Ashkenaz schools, one is forbidden to read Greek philosophy, which Rabbi Feinstein, uh, in a different teshuva, considered foolish and empty. In the early medieval period in Andalusia, Sephardic Jews had access to the latest advances in the study of science and logic, as well as access to translations of Greek philosophy. As I said, they mastered Hebrew grammar as their Islamic counterparts mastered Arabic grammar. The creative output of the golden age of Spain produced works in biblical grammar, biblical exegesis, works in philosophy, logic, medicine, and codes of Jewish law organized and accessible to the non-expert. And this philosophy, this approach has survived the Middle Ages right through today. For example, Rabbi Chaim David Halevi, who died around 1996, had a vastly different attitude to secular studies 
than did Rabbi Feinstein, including Greek philosophy. Rabbi Halevi permitted the study of secular studies even on Shabbat to prepare for exams if it was for the sake of heaven, L'Shem Shamayim. And so you can look it up in uh, Asei Lecharav, volume one, uh, number 36, Teshuvah number 36. And so the Maimonidean controversy, which I encourage all of you to read about and, 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 and understand, it took place uh, at the end of the 12th century into the 13th century and peaked with the infamous ban on the study of Maimonides' philosophic works, is an example of a clash between two models of religious thinking, one developed in Moorish Spain and the other in Christendom. The Maimonidean tradition was heir to a pluralistic uh, worldview developed in Andalus and in Islamic lands, while the anti-Maimonidean movement emerged in the authoritarian societies of France, Germany, and Christian Spain. Chacham Faor Zichronoli Vracha argues that a primary element in uh, the conflict between the Maimonideans and their opposition was a fundamental principle about religion and Jewish law. The Sephardic communities adopted the Gaonic premise that Judaism is driven by a legal system based on an immutable covenant with God and based on democratic principles. While European Jewry introduced an element of fervor and zeal that at times supersedes the legal principles set forth by Halakha. <coughs> and so what you have is this prevailing value that characterizes Ashkenaz European attitudes towards Jewish law, which is the idea that piety supersedes halacha and is the noblest expression of Jewish practice. I'm not criticizing, I want this to be very clear, but that is the Ashkenaz uh, approach. Read the commentaries on the Pesukim, Kedoshim Tiyu, Ki Kadosh Ani Hashem. And compare the differences in terms of Andalusian, Sephardic interpretation of that Pasuk versus European Ashkenaz. So it is no surprise that European Jewry regarded all practices performed by their rabbinic um, authorities as canonical and immutable. This is why they do not and cannot distinguish between the three kinds of minhag. Sephardic jury of old Sepharad operated based on legal principles and insisted on distinguishing between um, different levels of minhag. The most tragic consequence of this divide is if you can just hold one second Someone needs my attention. Hold on one second, please. I apologize about that. Okay. Um, so I'm sorry. What I, what I want to say is as follows. The most tragic consequence of this divide is, believe it or not, the end result of the Shulchan Aruch of Rabbi Yosef Karo. Bear with me, stay with me. What, am I, what I am about to say is not controversial, it is fact. Rabbi Yosef Karo was a genius. His command of Torah Shebaal Peh was unparalleled. Karo went public with his grand ambition after the publication of 
the Bet Yosef. In his introduction of the Bet Yosef, Rabbi Karo wrote that his goal is to create a law for all of Jewry. And he's going to take the three pillars of his time, Alfasi, Rosh, and Harambam. And he's going to democratically choose the halacha based on these three, according to the majority rule. Cairo employed democratic principles in legislation, something he believed naively would resonate with all jury and all rabbinic authorities. Unfortunately and tragically, it did not. Ashkenaz jury did not employ democratic principles in legislative matters, rather they ruled authoritatively, hierarchically. And so it's no surprise that Rabbi Moshe Iserlis, better known as the Rema or Rama, who was born in Krakow in the 16th century. He assumed his rabbinic leadership role as head of the community around the time that Rabbi Yosef Cairo was completing his Bet Yosef and Shulchan Aruch. And despite the broad sources Rabbi Cairo utilized to cast a net over the European Jewish community's traditions, Rema published glosses, has sagot, on Cairo's Shulchan Aruch. Chacham Faor of blessed memory used to refer to these hasagot as violence, thereby supplanting Cairo's rulings with Ashkenaz jury's customs and rulings. Ra the Ramah deprived Rabbi Yosef Cairo's Irv of its universal authoritative quality and applicability. I want to read to you what the Rama wrote in his um, in what the Rama wrote. Let me see if I can find it. What the Rama wrote in his introduction to his glosses. Rama says as follows: I viewed all his referring to Cairo's statements in the Shulchan Aruch as having been presented as though they were given by Moses at divine command so that students would come and drink his words without challenging them. Therefore, I decided that at those places where Cairo's statements do not seem to me to be correct, I would write down next to each statement the opinion of the acharonim in order to make students aware of every instance of his statement his statements are where his statements are disputed without consideration to rabbi caro's intended goals the rama undid a man's life's work. As a result, the Shulchan Aruch is not a pure Sephardic legal code. You understand what I'm saying, correct? The Shulchan Aruch codified the Halakha, Yosef Karo codified the Halakha in accordance to three opinions. It's not a pure Sephardic halacha anymore. This is the great tragedy of the Shulchan Aruch. And so we need to untie this knot in our brains. Years ago, I asked Chacham Ovadia Yosef about this. And his response was, he smacked me in the cheek a few times like he was known to do. And he says to me, 
מי יודע? Uh, he would say to me, מי יודע uh, מחשבותו, מחשבו של הקדוש ברוך הוא? Who knows what uh, הקדוש ברוך הוא wants of us? And so uh, Rama achieved notoriety by glossing over Karo's works. Um, let's close with a halakhic example, and then we'll <coughs> take some questions, and hopefully I'll be able to answer. There's a principle in halakha, it's called over l'asiyatan. The Gemara in Masechet Pesachim, and in other places, states that all berachot recited over a mitzvah must be recited before, over the performance, le'asiyatam, of the mitzvah. There's no machloket in this regard in the Bavli. The Talmud Yerushalmi in Masechet Berachot preserves a minority opinion of Rav Huna and of Shemuel that a beracha must be recited during the performance of a mitzvah, b'sha'at asiyatam. The Geonim universally accepted the majority opinion that all berachot, especially birkot mitzvah, must be recited before the performance of the action. According to Rab Chofni Gaon, there are seven types of brachot. Harambam narrows the categories of uh, berachot to three, birkat mitzvah, birkat ne'enin, and birkat hoda'a. And according to Harambam, the principle of over siyatan applies to all three types of berachot. What appears to be exceptions are not really exceptions. For example, in chapter 11 of Hilchot Berachot, uh, Harambam rules that ideally one should recite the Beracha on Tefillin before putting on the Tefillin, but uh, if you did not, you can recite the Beracha anytime while the Tefillin is on. This is not an exception to the rule of Over Siyatan. This is it brings in another rule in its place. But in the 12th century, a Chacham, Rabbi Zechariah HaLevi from Girona, also known as Baal HaMaor, in the yeshiva world, the Baal HaMaor. Um, do you guys know where Girona is? Girona is very much northern Spain. It's on the border of uh, Spain and southern France. The Baal HaMaor writes where he completely disregards the majority ruling of the Bavli and rules like the minority opinion found in the Yerushalmi. Now, truthfully, this is a shocking idea. But what ends up happening is that the schools of northern Spain and Ashkenaz create this whole literature to explain why the Baal HaMaor is correct. But he's not. <laughs> the Bavli is very, very clear. That's why I chose this example. The Bavli is clear. The conclusion of the Bavli is clear that there is such a principle as over la siyatan. The consequences of this Baal HaMaor have changed and impacted halacha in significant ways. Harambam in a strong polemic against the, uh, this attitude, he writes in um, Hilchot Tefillah, chapter seven. He's discussing the Birkot Hashachar, the brachot we make every morning. Shemona Esrei Berachot Elu Ein Lahen Seder. Those 18 blessings we make in the morning, they don't have any particular order, says. Ela Mevarech Kol Echat 
מהן על דבר שהברכה בשבילו בשעתו. One must recite each blessing prior to the very action that he is uh, uh, about to do, if not an, an action or the experience that he has. If you hear uh, the rooster, you say, uh, uh, you're going to put on your hat, that's what Haram Bam says. He's very clear. In Halacha 9, and I'm reading out of my Kapach Rambam edition. If you look behind you, I have about five different editions of Harambam in my library. Kapach, of course, is my favorite to go to. Harambam writes in very unusual that he that he that he uses the Mishneh Torah for this purpose. Nahaguha am berov arenu levarech brachot elu kulan zu achar zu bebeit haknesset. He says that the tradition has become popular in our towns that people recite these blessings in the synagogue one after the other. Whether they are obligated on these blessings or not. He says this is a mistake. One should not do this. One should not recite a blessing if he's not obligated to recite the blessing. And he certainly should not all recite a blessing once he's already performed the mitzvah. This is a transgression of it's uh, number two of the Ten Commandments. Regarding the Tilat Yadayim, this is another place where this uh, Baal HaMaor has had significant uh, impact. The Shulchan Aruch, Harambam in chapter 6 of Ilchot Brachot, and har- the Shulchan Aruch codifies it as such, one must recite a bracha of Netilat Yadayim prior to the washing of the hands. The Rama writes over there in the Shulchan Aruch that no, in Ashkenaz we do it after. There's a lot of literature as to if it's prior to the drying of the hands or after the drying of the hands or while the drying of the hands. Clearly, again, there's a halacha over la siyatan. This impacts uh, the bracha women make at the mikveh. Sephardic women, ideally, and unfortunately many do not know this, ideally should make their bracha before they go into the water. They are hopefully robed. They make the bracha and then enter the water. In Again, the Ramah and in Ashkenaz literature, they say no. The woman first enters the water and then makes the bracha. (coughs) The uh, best known difference is Hadlakat Neirot Shabbat. Again, where um, a Sephardic woman should ideally follow the halacha according to Sephardic tradition. You make the bracha and then you light Neirot Shabbat, as opposed to the way the Ramah suggests, first you light and then you make the bracha. Now, of course, in every one of these instances, there's a great deal of literature as to why they do it this way. I remember when uh, I was uh, saying Kaddish for my father, Zichron Oli Bracha, and I would, uh, at the time, I would travel a lot and I would end up in a uh, Ashkenaz Minyan, they would ask me to do Shacharit. I refused to do Birkota Shachar out loud for everybody. Now, the truth is I converted many good Ashkenaz rabbis after we had our conversation and discussion as to why I refused to do it. Um, but I heard all kinds of reasons as to why it's done that way. They wrote Shabbat, many reasons. You know, when you make the bracha, you've accepted Shabbat. That's not the case. That's not true. But all those reasons, notwithstanding, this is a classic example of um, Sephardic Jewry 
really following a legal principle that is clearly stated in the Talmud. And um, while European jury uh, allowing itself and permitting its chachamim to deviate from those principles for whatever reasons. Um, uh, before I take questions, I do want to say the following. Uh, I, I appreciate your attention. It's been, uh, my God, I, I've been talking for a very long time. Um, I do want to say the following. Those of you that are in this camp that really want to uh, uh, learn more about the roots of our traditions and the nature of our Sephardic traditions and um, uh, really come to, you know, uh, better grasp it. Uh, it. It's important that we always remain precise and not permit ourselves to be sloppy in how we present material and how we observe uh, our, our traditions. Um, and uh, the worst thing we can do is, uh, you know, be out there and, and, and put things out there that really aren't grounded in, in, in uh, uh, or based in, 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 in halakha and, uh, uh, and in substance. And so it's important that uh, we, you know, we, 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 we study together, we learn together, we learn from each other to really get to the root and understand our, our tradition. I open the floor for questions. Uh, uh, Sina, would you like to uh, take Thank the lead yeah. on that? First of all, I wish you would see the comments I'm getting. Um, it's so, so uh, inspiring, so fascinating. Thank you so much for everything you've shared. Um, where are the questions? Uh, we've had a f quite a few interesting dialogues in the chat. Uh, if anybody wants to unmute, uh, please do put, uh, well, you don't need to put your hands up. That's a little bit too organized for a Safari Khabara. Just feel free to unmute and ask your question. Um, I'm looking at some of these comments. Can someone please share the article in the chat? Okay, good. Yes, that's it. Jewish ideas. Thank you. Uh, they actually get it with all due respect. Ah, here's a question. The fact that Rama felt the need to add his gloss in the first place demonstrates the lack of universal, universality of Rav Karo's work uh, in the first place in that it ignored the halakhic views and traditions in Ashkenaz. I had so, briefly responded to that to say that's because Ashkenaz represented only 30% of world Jewry at the time, but uh, I'm sure the Hakam has a more accurate answer. No, that, that's, that's, that, that's the answer. It just didn't take into consideration what, Chacham, what, what uh, Rabbi Yosef Karo was intending to do. And... Um, yeah, that's the right answer. If the Ramah uh, wanted to put out his own code of Jewish law, he should have done so. Uh, uh, yeah. Does anybody, if anybody wants to add to that, I mean. Uh, yeah, sorry, can I just come in on that if that's okay? Sure. Um, sure. Who, who I just, is uh, it's Jack. I'm hiding behind a blank screen. Okay. <laughs> so one of the uh, very much enjoying the 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 sure. I think that um, you could make the counter argument that if the Ramah had written his own work, I'm, I'm stealing a point uh, from Zev, but also one I heard in yeshiva multiple times. If the Ramah had written his own work, that would have separated uh, uh, the for the total separation between the Ashkenazi and, and Sephardic world. But at least now everyone's broadly on the same metaphorical prayer book. And so there's so, an argument to be had that the Ramah promoted unity. So let me, let me respond to that. As a uh, Sephardic Jew, uh, the Shulchan Aruch created a work that was uh, uh, pariv. It wasn't pure Sephardic because his goal was to include Ashkenaz Jewry. So, the Ramah, by glossing, created a work for the Ashkenazim, which further divided <laughs> the community. And the Sephardim now are left with a work that is not purely Sephardic. And that's where the term tragedy comes in. You know what I'm saying to you? I, I, I disagree that now, now we're all 
revolving around the same um, uh, text. I would say, if you ask me, I try to posek halacha as much as I can based on Harambam and the Geonim and, their, and, and the Rimigash and Alfasi, if, if I'm interested in purely Sephardic tradition. Um, so yeah, just very briefly. First, yeah, on a personal level, I very much, uh, I very much like the approach you just outlined. I just, um, I'm just not convinced by the argument because the, the Ramah clearly felt that the Ashkenazi, and he writes this very clearly in his introduction, that it's very nice he laid this table, but he didn't invite us. So I'm going to have to put out my 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 tablecloth so we can at least take part. The Rosh is not a sufficient representation of the Ashkenazi halachic history and, and Masara. Well, the Rosh was the luminary of Ashkenaz jury at that time. And the point, I don't know, I don't know if you know a little bit of the history of Rabbi Yosef Karo. He had, he had messianic and, you know, visions. He wanted to establish a Sanhedrin. Uh, he imagined a unified Jewish people. That was, this was part of his grand plan and grand scheme. Um, and Ashkenaz jury was invited to the table. That was the whole point of the work. There was no greater scholar than Rabbi Yosef Karo in that generation. No okay. way. I mean, no I'm, way. Sure we, I'm sure we could go on, but I'll, I'll leave it right. to someone right. else's kitchen. Thank you so much, Jack. And thank you, Rob. Uh, any other questions? I'd like to ask, uh, this is uh, Alan Harris. Uh, it's a bit of a digression, but um, you mentioned uh, the uh, issue of uh, Halel on uh, Rosh Chodesh and that Halel was uh, restricted. But how come we were able to add the Halel for uh, Yom Asmaut? Oh, excellent question. Excellent question. So uh, the Halel of Yom Asmaut um, is a day of uh, uh, celebration for the Jewish people. Um, and uh, Halel is, is a prayer that is, uh, shouldn't be used uh, you know, easily. It has to really be used at a time that is significant and meaningful. And the Chachamim, the rabbis of uh, the generation felt that it's an appropriate time to say Hallel. The great, great rabbis, the uh, chief rabbis of Israel and of diaspora uh, who believed in the Zionist uh, miracle, uh, instituted Hallel and we accept it as a people, those who embrace it. Um, I don't say a bracha on Yom Atzmaud Hallel, but I definitely say Hallel on it. No, 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 and, and I appreciate that. And that's really uh, what I was getting at is that uh, people like yourself do not say the bracha because I gather they don't feel, if I'm correct, entirely comfortable because we're overriding a principle, a, a very strong principle that there are a limited number of circumstances where you can say halal. Am I correct? Well, I, I, the, the issue of bracha is different than the limited circumstance when we can say halal. Bracha levatala is a very serious transgression. It's the a transgression of one of the Ten Commandments. And so we're very, very careful when uh, we institute a bracha on anything, a blessing on anything. Um, but uh, the... Uh, recitation of Hallel on Yom Ma'ut is a decision that the rabbis, leaders of our generation have made and we should all participate in that. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Thank you for the answer, Rob. Thank you. Uh, have you got a few more minutes for a few more questions, Rob? Sure, 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 sure. sure. Great. Uh, please do feel free to unmute. Any more questions? Uh, let me see some more of these comments. Um, can I totally undermines Varun's goal. No. Yeah, who's unmuted? I just unmuted. Hi, Sinai. It's, it's Paul here, Shrugger Hi. Want to see me? Hi. Yeah, yeah so oh. I, I'm an Ashkenazi, brought up Ashkenazi, governing in a, a Sephardi minion. And um, I feel at home there. Um, what about the idea that, um, culturally speaking, that can influence the way we express ourselves spiritually? I feel... I'm amongst um, people who I share a neshama with because of the hashkafa, their outlook. So the fact that I might be reading slightly different versions from the art scroll siddha rather than the, the Gibraltarian siddha doesn't seem to bother me. It's just because I'm amongst the people who, who I share um, 
share um, a cultural affiliation to for reasons I don't quite understand. And that's probably because I might, in my own way, um, have got the mimetic um, learning from families because I see them in hugging of, of say, my late father, who had um, ways of uh, expressing Hachnasa or him, which I specifically have experienced amongst the Sephardi community. So the question is, that transmission of minhag, so to speak, is also something that's cultural and uh, plays an important part in how one affiliates and identifies so with the other. A hundred percent correct. A hundred percent correct. I was, as I was trying to say earlier, law, um, law reflects values. Uh, custom reflects the culture. And, um, uh, you know, embracing culture and unique features of a culture is beautiful. Uh, and, and it's certainly a, a, a venue to uh, spiritual uh, growth and, 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 and uh, 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 you know, embracing and, and, and understanding Judaism, 100%. I, I agree with that 100%. Thank you for that comment. I just want to add that the problem with law is it has no texture, it's, it's words on paper, and it's very prescriptive. And to have a meta experience about the culture, more anthropological approach, is really the, the, the avenue of uh, the difference between reading the, reading the textbook and living, and living, living life. It's just a different way of engaging. Uh, and we are, so, we are so primed in reverting to the text because we've lost, we've got, we've lost that link but we can rediscover it in the here and now just by being amongst people who live it rather than just saying, well, what does the law say? And well, I'm only going to do that. And I find that, I find that very, very limiting. And that's what it is. I don't disagree with you. I, I invite you to read uh, an article written by Professor Chaim Soloveitchik. Um, uh, and uh, he discusses that very issue, the issue, the, the, um, the, 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 the historical movement from, you know, you know experiencing Judaism, uh, you know, and, and learning Judaism from how our parents and grandparents did it to the, you know, the printing press and, and an art scroll which teaches us Judaism from a, a written text. And it's two very different experiences. Um, but thank you. Yes, that's a good point. Um, thank you very much. Ask one quick, quick question. Yes. Abby, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, it's following up on, on we were talking about the Rosh and whether the Ashkenaz were, were represented fairly. Um, to what extent, though, because as we know, obviously the Rosh moved to Toledo um, and he was influenced by sort of the prevailing um, customs and the, or, or whatever it was that, that the Hashkafa was there before him. Um, to what extent was he influenced by that? And, and you know, is there a claim there to say that, you know, he, he left sort of Ashkenaz and uh, the tour and, and his descendants sort of were influenced by the Sepharadim. So it was not a, 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 um, a fair representation of the Ashkenaz. Excellent question. Are you any relation to Benito Garzon? No. I'm not, no, you know but I know is. who he is. Yeah, okay, yeah. so um, I would say as follows. I don't think the Rosh was influenced, but his son, Rabbi Yaakov ben Harosh, the author of the tour, if read carefully and studied carefully, you see this tension between growing up with your father, who is, you know, European in a society that is, Sephardic, and there are some gems. And you know, if if I had time and if uh, I was younger, that would be a work that I would do: is find those gems in the Tour Shulchan Aruch, the son of the Rosh, where you see the influence of the Sephardic culture and society around him being pulled with the traditions that his father was heir to. Uh, but I don't believe the Rosh was in any way influenced by the society he lived in. In fact, um, I invite you to read uh, 
Chacham Faur's uh, article on uh, uh, the uh, two schools of thought. Uh, Aaron, what's it called? If you can put it on the... Uh, two Jewish modes of spirituality, yeah. I think. Yeah, correct. Two modes of spirituality, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. So, two, two Jews. And the, the Rosh was not, was not influenced. He, 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 you know, we imagine the Rosh as very authoritarian in terms of his thinking and his rulings. Uh, definitely when it came to uh, uh, traditions, of European traditions. And Rav, we actually had Professor Eric Lowry a couple of weeks ago to come and explain the reception of Rashid's commentary in Safarad. And he had mentioned that the tour, as you mentioned, Rosh's son, um, that tension was there in his writings that you described, where he said that uh, he saw how the Safaradim was so passionate about studying Mikra. Absolutely. And he said, I wish we could take that to Ashkenaz, he said, where they had this Mikra played such a uh, primary role in yes, uh, for our yes. learning. That's just one example, that, that one of the gems, if you like. I'm familiar um, with that. I, I believe the Rosh, in his, in his will to his sons, or, um, he speaks about, like, we should do like the Sefaradim, that they, they um, care so much about grammar. Um, and that's one of the messages. That, that's like a hint that there, must, there may have been some influence, but maybe that was at the end of his life, or, or maybe that didn't come into the Halakha, that, that was... I'm not familiar um, yeah. with that. Can All you... I remember from the, the interaction between Rosh and Safarad is when he arrived and said, thank God I do not have their worldly knowledge. Because <laughs> I do believe right. that Rosh was quite taken aback by how worldly right. the Safaradim were with regards to secular knowledge. So right. I think the tension was quite there when the Hacham arrived in Northern, in Northern Spain. Right, right. Um, <coughs> uh, good, good. Right. Any other questions? Excuse hey, me, could I just one ask? Last Alan, go ahead. Yeah, if I could just ask one question, because the Rambam is such a towering figure, respected quasi-universally, whether it's by the Brisker, you talked about uh, Chaim Soloveitchik and, and let alone the Rav, yet the, there's an impression that the Ashkenazim basically are the ones are the calling the shots. When the, 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 the greatest authorities, be it halachic or Talmudic, recognize the supremacy of, uh, of the Rambam. And it's kind of a dichotomy there that I find very difficult to reconcile. As we all do, my good friend, Alan. It's very <laughs> and difficult. I, and I'm an Ashkenaz. And I'm an Ashkenaz. Very difficult. I, I'm actually a Litvak. You I'm cannot, there's no. There's no yeshiva in the world that doesn't study Harambam's Mishneh Torah. But most yeshivot don't open his Moreh Nebuchim. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's hard to reconcile. Hard to reconcile. Um, yeah. There I got to have to leave it at that in the interest you know of what? time. <laughs> One of the root, you know, a root issue which I was uh, engaged in this past week in emails with, uh, with, with, uh, with, a, with a scholar was um, how uh, European jury versus uh, uh, Sephardic jury regarded the close of the Talmud and how they related to the close of the Talmud. This is a very, very important issue, one that requires uh, an entire uh, discussion. But that is another root issue that's very, very important and, 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 and probably uh, uh, explains the parting of ways uh, between Sephardic and, uh, and uh, Sephardic jury and Ashkenaz jury. Rav, thank you so, <laughs> so much. Um, we need to put in dates for you to come back. Be my pleasure. You've, uh, you've, you've built a real fan base here at the Chabura, yeah. and uh, we really, really honor. And we really, really are, you know, honored to, ha to, to be able to have Hacham share these ideas with us. Um, so thank you on behalf thank of everybody here. Thank you for your participation. You. And I hope, I hope uh, it was not a waste of anybody's time. Uh, no, not at all. I'm looking forward to the review. Rav, where can people catch your work, your uh, organization, et cetera, et cetera? Please do share. So I, I, I invite everybody, if you want to email questions, I try to respond to everybody who emails me, usually not on the same day. My email is yaminlevy at gmail.com. Um, I invite you to visit uh, our website. There's, there's a video, YouTube videos, as well as I think my written material is on the website. Um, 
mhcny.org.org, Maimonides Heritage Center. Um, and um, uh, I invite you all to, 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 to visit it and stay in yeah. touch. Uh, we will thank be. you. Thank you very much, Rav. Thank you so much. You. Everybody, good day, good night, wherever you are. Uh, Rav, is there anything else you'd like to add? I, I want to read through the comments before you close me out. So, no uh, problem. Okay, so I'll just exit out as soon as I finish. That sounds okay. good. I'll, I'll yeah. kick everybody else out. Good night, everybody. <laughs>